By way of introduction, um, the library usually likes to do an annual poetry um, read aloud in celebration of National Poetry Month, which is April. And some folks have said, why didn't you do it in person this year? Well, we still, you know, we had to plan ahead and we really weren't sure what the um, campus protocol would be. So here we are on Zoom again. But what I wanna do is uh, say thank you to all for being here. And what we're gonna do is start off with, um, um, we just got her to come a minute ago. Her name is Joan Herwitt and she manages the CPAC here on the Cuesta campus, which is the theater. She's in another room. So we were just running back and forth. And she's actually had firsthand experience working with Joy Harjo, who is the poet laureate of the United States and has been for a couple um, years now, two, three, four years. And we're gonna hear some of her poems a little bit later on from some of our other readers, but we wanted to snag Joan and let her share with us her, um, her interaction with Joy Harjo. So with that, let's let Joan take it away and hear from her. Thank you. Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, thanks for the thumbs up. Um, so like Denise said, I'm the CPAC supervisor here at Cuesta. I run both theaters at the uh, CPAC venue. And um, yes, I did have a chance to work with Joy back in 2009 when we were developing her one woman show. So I was at school at San Diego State University at the time and my professor, Randy Reinhold, who is Choctaw, really started to incorporate indigenous playwrights and indigenous artists into our curriculum. And uh, at the same time, he was also the artistic and executive director of Native Voices at the Autry, which is the premier US Native American um, play company in uh, the US. And that's stationed at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. So we would often go back and forth between working in San Diego and shows in Los Angeles, oftentimes partnering with the La Jolla Playhouse as well, where I also worked. So I spent about 10 years on and off with Native Voices at the Autry. Um, and still to this day, some of those artists and you know uh, technicians are some of my best friends. So working with Joy was an absolute joy. I didn't even mean to say it that way, but uh, it really truly was. Um, so the, the one woman show that we were developing at the time is called uh, Wings of Night Sky, Wings of Morning Light. And when I say developing, I mean, really, this was just, you know, writing it with her from beginning to end. So I got to serve as the assistant director to Randy, and I also got to serve as the assistant dramaturg to uh, Shirley, who was at the Playhouse. So really such a hands-on experience. And it's so funny, I came over to the library today because I, I guess I was just missing the library and, and um, printed out a couple things to share with you. We would start every rehearsal um, with dance. Uh, we would put on music that brought us joy and we would play and explore and just be free and just be silly. Um, and so here are a couple photos. <laughs> oh, I went old school and printed them out. But here we are in the rehearsal room. And here is us mid dance move. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember, um, there was a song that was popular, made popular at that time. I think it was called High Joe, and it might have been popular in the movie Slumdog Millionaire. Um, and that was like our like favorite go to pump up um, song that we would dance with. And the playmaking process is gonna be different with every playwright. And with Joy, it was so autobiographical and it was so in depth. Um, lots of reflections on Indian boarding schools and her childhood and growing up between such loving family, but then also such um, uh, unrest in her community. So it was really important for us to set an intention at the beginning of our rehearsal, every rehearsal and start that process with joy and with uh, joy again, um, a lightness and lightheartedness and fun because we knew that we were gonna be diving into some pretty uh, deep and intense material. 
Um, I'll never forget that rehearsal process. <laughs> um, it introduced me to so many different ideas and ways to access art and the ways that we uh, use it every day and it comes out every day. I don't think I ever had an interaction with Joy that didn't feel like poetry in itself. I mean, I wouldn't say that she was like a poet by career, like poetry is just who Joy is. Um, she embodies it and she really has such an ethereal way of impressing that then onto everyone who she's in the room with. I mean, the room just changes when she you know, steps in. And we actually, so the show itself was not just a play. It was also um, a collaboration with a musician who I, I know she still works with regularly. I think they have a show together next weekend, Larry Mitchell, who plays saxophone. I mean, he's just a multi-talented musician. And a lot of the play was not just finding how the poetry fit on stage, but also how did that poetry fit in song? And, and if you've ever seen Joy perform, half the time she also, you know, she'll read a poem, but she'll also perform it as, as music, as a full um, musical expression. It's so, it's so funny. I almost don't want to limit it by just saying the word song either. It's like so much more than that. So um, we also got to work with Larry in developing what those songs sounded like, how they fit into the narrative. And the narrative itself went from reality and you know a chronological timeline that made sense um, to something that didn't make sense and something that was totally dreamlike and really ethereal and, and almost inaccessible. But here you are sitting on top of the world in her with this, you know, with her in this magical space. So it was just, such an incredible experience. I'd be happy to, to share more on that if you have any questions and all the dance moves that we would do together. Um, so I have um, a quick question for you, Joan. Sure. Um, Joy is a, a saxophonist and um, lyricist, a composer of lyrics herself too. Yes. So did was that incorporated into the production? It was, yes. The stage itself was set up in such a way that she could access anything that she needed, whether it be instrument or, um, you know, a traditional instrument or a non-traditional instrument that played a part in creating a soundscape. Um, even the scenic design itself, oh, we worked with this amazing set painter that painted this backdrop and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the muslin material but it's translucent enough when you light it in front you can't see what's behind but if you light it from behind it just has a completely different effect so depending on how it's painted and the colors that are used to then light it it was painted in such a way that we really did get to see the entire full cycle of morning to night and then morning again and it was just I mean I have chills just thinking about it again now so do you think there's any kind of a video online of the production or part of it? I'll have to go back and look. Yeah. I'm sure, I mean, there are excerpts from the play that you can find. Um, and I think this is how I discovered the poem that I'll be reading today um, is that it's incorporated into the play. There must be, I mean, I must have some video myself. Yeah, don't, some. don't worry about it. Just a thought, if you come across something, you can share it with me and I can put it out to the group at a later date. I'll definitely investigate. Well, your excitement is definitely palpable, so we, we appreciate that. Um, so which poem were you going to read? You said you had a favorite one of Joy Harjo's. I do. My all-time favorite poem is a Joy Harjo poem, and it's titled, Perhaps the World Ends Here. And I'm glad that this is an intimate group and only half of your videos are on, because I'll admit right now, I, I don't think I have ever once in my life made it through this poem without crying. And I don't know, I don't know if that if this is the same for you or if you have an experience or, or poems that do that to you, but they just completely break me apart so I can put myself back together again. Um, this is actually a poem that I, um, since, since working on that play with Joy, I've read at our Thanksgiving table every year. And I also don't think I've ever made it through the end of the poem. I usually just pass it off to my mom who then finishes it for me. Um, but we'll, well, I practiced this morning, so we'll see how far I can get. <laughs> Are you ready? Should I start? All right. Perhaps the world ends here. 
The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children. are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves as, and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow, we pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating the last sweet bite. That's from her book, The Woman Who Fell From the Sky, published in 94. It's funny, I have a video clip. I have a, a few that we were maybe gonna watch today and one of them is that one so oh. it, it's ringing well, very smart <laughs> <laughs> well you did great with that thank you so much does thank anyone have a, have a question for joan in terms of her work with the poet or what that was like and you can always put questions in the chat um laurie and i will be kind of fielding those all righty well, let's thank Joan, and then we're going to go on. And I've got a list of people that have told me they want to read. And um, if you have not told me that and you want to read, you can raise your hand. You can put that in the chat. Um, on the other hand, you don't have to read. You can just sit back and enjoy. Um, and again, this is part of Cuesta's um, Celebration of National Poetry Month, which is April. And if you're wondering why we chose the theme of um, celebrating with Native American works, it's because it's linked into our book of the year choice this year, which is, um, oh gosh, They're There, as if I could forget that, by Tommy Orange. It's funny, uh, a few times some of us working on it have called it um, Orange Orange instead of They're There. We got a little turned around. But he'll be coming on April 21st. And uh, towards the end of our um, session here today, I'll um, do a screen share and just remind you about how you can get tickets. It's $5 general admission. If you're a student at Cuesta, you can attend free. You just have to let us know to reserve your seat. Okay, with that, I have another person. Let's see, is Paul here? Paul also has to get back to work. So we appreciate him taking a slice of his time. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Paul and he's got two poems that he's gonna read. And maybe Paul, can you tell us um, besides the poet a little, do you know like one or two uh, lines about the poet, where they're from or what um, tribe they might be from? Actually I do. Um, thank you, Denise. Uh, sure. the, poem, the poet is uh, Dwayne Niatum, Niatum. Uh, N-I-A-T-U-M, and he's written uh, Snowy Owl Near Ocean Shores and Love Poem, both short works that I'll be reading today. Um, some of the awards and honors that uh, Duane has won in his life was um, the 2017 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas, the Nelson Bentley Award, uh, the University of Washington Department of English in 1982, a Poetry in Motion Grant Award, um, First Prize Poetry, Pacific Northwest Writers Conference, both 1966 and in 1970. And he also won an American Book Award in 1982. Um, I think that more for his, his work as an editor of uh, poetry anthologies, um, he's 
been more praised for that than for his actual poems. However, uh, the the two of his that I've read, I can't understand uh, why they wouldn't be at the top of the prize list. And uh, having said that, I'll start with uh, a snowy owl near ocean shores. That's a castaway blown south to from these are camera. No. I don't know. Sorry, why don't you just start over, please, Paul? Okay, well, let's see. I'll start again. Um, Snowy Owl Near Ocean Shores by Dwayne Needham. The castaway blown south from the Arctic tundra yeah. sits on a stump in an abandoned <laughs> farmer's field. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, we're having uh, little issues with audio. We seem to be good again now. Thanks, Lori. Okay, Paul, let's try it for a third time. <laughs> okay. All right. Looks like he, he needs to help us do. Okay. Um, we will regroup and let's, oh. Paul's coming into my office because he's. Okay, and now Getting Don. feedback where he's at, so he's gonna read it from here. Oh, that's okay, okay. And, you know, I can, uh, Don, there's a, Don, there's a student who is trying to join us. Greg, you'll know him. He's probably out on a library computer and I think he's not, he keeps unmuting himself. Do you, do you mind taking a quick peek? Sorry, guys. Yeah, I'm here. I'm turning off the mute. Okay, thank you. So I won't... All right. Okay, so are we good to go? Right on. Okay. <laughs> Snowy Owl near Ocean Shores. A castaway blown south from the Arctic tundra sits on a stump in an abandoned farmer's field. Beyond the dunes, cattails toss and bend as snappy as the surf, rushing and crashing down the jetty. His head a swivel of round glances, his eyes a deeper yellow than the winter sun. He wonders if the spot 200 feet away is a mouse on the crawl from mud hole to the deer grass patch. An hour of wind and sleet sweeps the air. Nothing darts or passes but the river underground. A North Pole creature shows us how to, at last. The wind ruffles his feathers from crown to claw. While he gazes into zeros, the salt slick rain. As a double rainbow before us arcs sky and owl, we leave him surrendering to the echo of his white refrain. And that completes that one. And the second is Love Poem, which is a, a, a little bit shorter, um, but it, it is quite powerful. I think you'll like The Twilight of Your Face. The unknown bird in your voice drew me to your eyes' green vision. Your song about a moment that stood in the shadow of a moon vulnerability. A Natalie I saw standing alone at your friend Carolyn's party years ago, where you called me to your side and I held my heart cupped in the palm of my life as an offering to your smile, our soft-spoken isolation. Hmm. Isolation it's certainly rings a bell these days. It certainly does. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I do thank apologize you. for the technical. Uh, oh, technical I, I, it's not, thanks for, for being there and persevering. You're All welcome. right. I'm going to return Don to his office. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Who knows what was out there? So, Don, are you okay going next? I'm always ready to talk. <laughs> Let me close my door. So as you can see, we've got a mix of people who are in their offices at Cuesta and then all kinds of people that are in their homes or their studios or their anywhere. So we're kind of dealing with all of that. That's great. Thanks, Don. Thank you. So um, I chose Louise Erdrich. Um, I'm going to read the little blurb off the back of one of her wonderful books called The Night Watchman. Uh, Louise Erdrich's fiction has won the National Book Award, National Book Critics Circle Award twice been a finalist 
for the Pulitzer Prize and received Library of Congress Prize in American Fiction. She has received Library of Congress Prizes in Fiction, prestigious pen awards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Louise Erdrich, a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, lives in Minnesota with her daughters and is the owner of Birch Bark Books, a small independent bookstore. And if you're wondering why I chose Louise, um, of course, anything that I'm interested in has to have something to do with ghosts or monsters or something haunted. And she wrote this really, really great poem called The Wendigo. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have heard of the Wendigo before. Wendigo is a, basically the Native American boogeyman. So the uh, people would, would tell their children stories of the Wendigo coming to capture them, take them away into the forest and eat them, uh, just as we in our Irish culture, et cetera, has uh, stories of the boogeyman doing the same thing. There's two origins of the, of the Wendigo. The first origin is that people of the tribe who for whatever reason got separated and ended up having to become cannibals would turn into Wendigos. And then the second one, which is the, the idea that Luis here follows is that um, the Wendigo is a winter demon who has consumed a tribesman at some point, frozen the tribesman inside of itself and then goes about trying to find more people to consume. And the legend is, is that a child at some point uh, was able to melt the heart and the frozen person inside the Wendigo by forcing the Wendigo to eat boiling lard. So there you go, there's your background. I'm gonna read you this really, really cool poem. The Wendigo. You knew I was coming for you, little one. Yes, when the kettle jumped into the fire and towels flapped on the hooks and the dogs crept off groaning to the deepest part of the woods. In the hackles of dry brush, a thin laughter started up. Mother scolded the food warm and smooth in the pot and it called you to eat. But I spoke in the cold trees, whispering, new one, I have come for you, child, hide and lie still. The sumac pushed sour red cones through the air. Copper burned in the raw wood. You saw me drag toward you. Oh, touch me, I murmured and licked the soles of your feet. You dug your hands into my pale melting fur. I stole you off. A huge thing in my bristling armor, steam rolled from my wintry arms, each leaf shivered from the bushes we passed until they stood naked, spread like the clean spines of fish. Then your warm hands hummed over and shoveled themselves full of the ice and the snow. I, I would darken and spill all night running until at last morning broke the cold earth. And I carried you home, a river shaking in the sun. There you go. Wow, I don't know if I'm scared or what. <laughs> Weirded out. All right, very good. I feel like I've been in a forest though. All righty, thank you, Don. Okay, I've got Lori up next for, she's got, I'm not sure which one she wants to read first, but why don't we go with one of them and then we can come back around if that works for you. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I will start with a poem by Tommy Pico. <laughs> I found myself like going against the grain on this assignment and he did, he has a, okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about Tommy Pico. He is an indigenous writer, poet, and podcast host, um, born in 1983. He grew up on the Viejas Reservation of the Cumier Nation near San Diego. 
Um, he co-curates a live poetry reading series called Poets with Attitude. He's also a TV show writer, a co-host of a podcast, and he has published four books of poetry. And so, like I mentioned, I'm going to read just a section from his epic poem called Nature Poem. The stars are dying, like always, and far away. Like what you see looking up is a death knell from light, right? Light years, but also close, like the sea stars on the Pacific coast. Their little arms lesion and knot and pull away the insides, spill into the ocean. Massive deaths. When I try to sleep, I think about orange cliffs, bare of orange stars, knotted, glut. Waves are clear, anemones and shit, sand crabs and shit, fleas. There are seagulls overhead. Ugh, I swore to myself I would never write a nature poem. The sand is fine. They say it's not Fukushima. I feel fine in the sense that I feel very thin. I've been doing Tracy Anderson DVD workouts on YouTube, keeping my arms fit and strong. She says, reach like you are being pulled apart. I can't not spill. Sometimes it, sometimes what you see is what you glut. There are sometimes insides. I can't write a nature poem because it's fodder for the noble savage narrative. I would slap a tree across the face, I say to my audience. Let's say I'm at a pizza parlor. Let's say I'm having a slice at the bar. This man walks in to pick up his to-go order. Let's say his order isn't ready yet and he's chatty. Let's say I'm in Portland because people don't talk to me in NYC. Let's say he's like, meatballs are for the baby, pizzas for the little man, Caesar salads for the wife, and the beer, he points to the beer and then thumbs at himself, the beer's for me. He has one of those cracked skin summer smiles. He keeps talking like I want to hear him, like he's so comfortable, like everybody owes him attention. I'm a weirdo Indian faggot. He puts his hands on the ribs of my chair, asks, do I want to go into the bathroom with him? Let's say it doesn't turn me on at all. Let's say I literally hate all men because literally men are animals. This is a kind of nature I would write a poem about. So I'll just stop there. But that's just the first two pages of his of his poem. I'm not going to get takeout pizza tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was that was definitely the anti nature poem. <laughs> Okay, I think we, uh, I'll, I'll just let you know what I've got lined up. So we're looking at Marcia, and then Greg, and then probably Rachel. And then are there any other folks that think they might want to read something? No pressure, only if you want to. Okay, so then we'll continue on with our lineup. And uh, Marcia has a couple to choose from. Which one are you going to go with um, this time? Do you think we have time for the long one? Yeah, go for it. I'll try to be quick. One of the reasons I can't read my shorter one is because that's the one Joan read. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. I could be, uh, I could get something quickly too. I'll try to keep it um, quick. What I'll skip is my very long unpacking. I practiced this a couple of times and I realized that I always had this sort of long introduction for you all, which is a bit of a bad habit of the instructor. <laughs> So let's say that I just want you to ride it. Don't, don't try to figure out necessarily who the um, narrator is. Just go into the space and, and enjoy your time there. It has five parts and I'm gonna stop at each part and tell you that the number of the part and, and the title of the part. She had some horses by Joy Harjo. One, she had some horses. She had some horses. She had horses who were bodies of sand. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. She had horses who were skins of ocean water. She had horses who were the blue air of sky. She had horses who were fur and teeth. 
She had horses who were clay and would break. She had horses who were splintered red cliff. She had some horses. She had horses with eyes of trains. She had horses with full brown thighs. She had horses who laughed too much. She had horses who threw rocks at glass houses. She had horses who licked razor blades. She had some horses. She had horses who danced in their mother's arms. She had horses who thought they were the sun and their bodies shone and burned like stars. She had horses who waltzed nightly on the moon. She had horses who were much too shy and kept quiet in stalls of their own making. She had some horses. She had horses who liked creek stomp dance songs. She had horses who cried in their beer. She had horses who spit at male queens and made them afraid of themselves. She had horses who said they weren't afraid. She had horses who lied. She had horses who told the truth, who were stripped bare of their tongues. She had some horses. She had horses who called themselves horse. She had horses who called themselves spirit and kept their voices secret and to themselves. She had horses who had no names. She had horses who had books of names. She had some horses. She had horses who whispered in the dark, who were afraid to speak. She had horses who screamed out of fear of the silence, who carried knives to protect themselves from ghosts. She had horses who waited for destruction. She had horses who waited for resurrection. She had some horses. She had horses who got down on their knees for any savior. She had horses who thought their high price had saved them. She had horses who tried to save her, who climbed in her bed at night and prayed as they raped her. She had some horses. She had some horses she loved. She had some horses she hated. These were the same horses. Two, two horses. I thought the sun breaking through Sangre de Cristo Mountains was enough and that wild musky sense on my body after long nights of dreaming could unfold me to myself. I thought my dance alone through worlds of odd and eccentric planets that no one else knew would sustain me. I mean, I did learn, learn to move after all and how to recognize voices other than the most familiar. But you must have grown out of a thousand years dreaming, just like I could never imagine you. You must have broke open from another sky to hear because now I see you as a part of the millions of other universes that I thought could never occur in this breathing. And I know you as myself traveling. In your eyes alone are many colonies of stars and other circling planet motion. And then your fingers, the sweet smell of hair and your soft, tight belly. My heart is taken by you. And these mornings, since I am a horse running towards a cracked sky where there are countless dawns breaking simultaneously, there are two moons on the horizon. And for you, I have broken loose. Three, drowning horses. She says she is going to kill herself. I am a thousand miles away, listening. To her voice in an ocean of telephone sound, gray sky and nearly sundown, I don't ask her how. I am already familiar with the weapons. A restaurant that wouldn't serve her, the thinnest laughter, another drink. And even if I weren't closer to the cliff edge of the talking wire, I would still be another mirror, another running horse. Her escape is my own. I tell her, yes, yes. We ride out for breath over the distance. Night air approaches the galloping other life. No sound, no sound. Four, ice horses. These are the ones who escape after the last hurt is turned inward. They are the most dangerous ones. The, these are the hottest ones, but so cold that your tongue sticks to them and is torn apart because it is frozen to the motion of hooves. These are the ones who cut your thighs, whose blood you must have seen on the gloves of the doctor's rubber hands. They are the horses who moaned like oceans and one of them, a young woman, screamed aloud. She was the only one. 
These are the ones who have found you. These are the ones who pranced on your belly. They chased deer out of your womb. These are the ice horses, horses who entered through your head and then your heart, your beaten heart. These are the ones who loved you. They are the horses who have held you so close that you have become a part of them, an ice horse galloping into fire. Five, explosion. The highway near Okama, Oklahoma exploded. They are reasons for everything. Maybe there is a new people coming forth, being born from the center of the earth like us, but another tribe. Maybe they will be another color that no one has ever seen before. Then they might be hated and live in Muskogee on the side of the tracks that Indians live on. And they will be the ones to save us. Maybe there are lizards coming out of rivers of lava from the core of this planet, coming to bring rain, to dance for the corn, to set fields of tongues slapping at the dark earth, a kind of a dance. But maybe the explosion was horses bursting out of the crazy earth near Okama. They were a violent birth, flew from the ground into trees to wait for evening night mares to come after them, then into the dank wet fields of Oklahoma, then their birth cords tied into the molten heart, then they travel north and south, east and west, then into wet while sheets at midnight where every, when everyone sleeps and the baby dreams of swimming in the bog. Woman who dances, shaking the seeds in her bones, then South Dakota, Mexico, Japan, and Manila, then into Miami to sweep away the knived faces of hatred. Some will not see them, but some will see the horses with their hearts of sleeping volcanoes and will be rocked awake past their bodies to see who they have become. And that's the end. Wow, I can see how you could spend quite a bit of time, you know, unpacking. And I had a print copy, so I was kind of reading along a little bit, but whoa, I, I'm not sure I get that one. I'm going to have to study up. I love the repetition, though. That's just really, it's like horse galloping along. All right, Marcia, that was great. All righty, who is our next victim? Oh, I've lost my little sheet here. Okay, Greg, are you with us and are you ready to read the section of your essay? Greg is. Uh, yes. Okay. And yes. did you. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment before I start. Sure. This is from a. Your audio is breaking up a little. I did. And this is actually part of a much longer essay, most of those, and get right to the part that's really more um, it's, it's been doing that all this time. So I'll see if I can get right to it. Okay. Um, in the Americas, these missionaries try to bring tribes, bring the forced Christian and Western cultural community. This effort also with the various Indian tribes managing to keep their own culture and religious traditions. Before the white man invaded, local California tribes were managing the forests and other areas with their version of controlled burns of small areas to avoid massive fires. In the 1800s, this practice was banned for more than 100 years with Devastating results resounding even today. In recent years, we're finally seeing the value of this ancient Indian environmental practice. American Indians have always been environmentalists, trying to live in balance with nature. Modern environmentalists are finding allies and joining with them. These Western arrogant missionaries ignored the wisdom of peoples living in the same area for thousands of years. We have paid the price for their arrogance. 
Now, environmental movements like Bioneers look for the wisdom of American Indians to solve various problems. Bioneers.org. A must read for American Indians is the book, The Darkening A Commended Video. Is a in the book you will see eerie parallels to the cultural genocide of American Indians that they used. That this isn't the first time they have used this playbook against Native peoples, and that'll be all. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, Greg. We we had a little bit of crackling, but and I just wanted to say this was a part of an essay that Greg, uh, a Cuesta student, had composed as part of a class assignment. Thank you for sharing that. Greg, could you say the name of that? Could you repeat the name of that book that you mentioned at the end? It got a little garbled. Uh, yeah, the, it's been doing that for a while now. I, it's not that cut sad. It's, just, it's called The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the classical world. And if you read it, you'd be shocked that the, the what happened to the, is, is so parallel to what happened to the American Indians. It's the same playbook. Taking people and their families, um, extraordinary violence. It's, it's a very difficult read, but it took me a year to get through it. It was so, I began to see that I lied to. This wasn't a peaceful transition. It was nothing of the kind that you were lied to. And the, the parallel what happened to American Indians is something a lot of people must read. If you can read this, any American Indian must read this because they'll see this is not the first time it's happened to people. And it's very, a very difficult. The Agura, if you read the original story about what happened, to, I believe the pronunciation is aphasia, but it's I can't pronounce okay, it. Okay, Greg, you're, you're breaking up. You know what I'm going to well, do? You're, you're in the library, right? What happened to aphasia? Greg, I'm, I'm going to come over and um, find out the name of the title for you, and then I'll type it back in the chat. So I'm going to um, I'm going to come see you in just one minute, and then meanwhile, I think we'll let Rachel. Are you ready? Feel like reading? Okay, and I'm going to step away from a minute and get that title. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm excited to get that title, and um, I'm so grateful that Greg read that. It's so wonderful to have students participate and share with us their work. It's what we're here for, so I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I'm actually going to be reading a poem by Simon J. Ortiz, and um, he is a Coma Pueblo, and he is actually um, considered kind of a contemporary of Joe Har Joy Harjo. Um, they came up about the same time, um, and they, he is not only a poet, he's also, um, a professor and he is, I put his name in the chat, Simon J. Ortiz, and he is really well known because, um, the poem I'm reading was published in 1977, but a lot of more contemporary indigenous authors will point to Simon Ortiz as somebody who has really influenced them. And um, Linda Hogan um, has been really influenced by Simon Ortiz. Um, Sherman Alexie was very much influenced by him. Um, and as I said, he and Joy Harjo were very much contemporaries. And um, he, one of the things that I really like about Simon Ortiz Ortiz is that he he's known for saying, um, I'm I'm telling you a story, so you better believe it's the truth. And capturing for all of those, all, all of us who love literature, the power of narrative, right? That in in narrative, in poetry, in story, we can um we can tell truths so much more clearly than some than we can often in nonfiction, and really capture um, the complexity of situations. So, um, so this is a poem by Simon J. Ortiz. I also um, 
well, I'll read it to you. It's called Vision Shadows. And this is sort of like probably one of the nature poems that um, Laurie's poet was sort of objecting to a little bit. Um, and and although you'll see that it it's um it's not it's not really feeding the noble savage imagery, but it is definitely sort of taking its um it's it's casting, and I think it actually connects to what Greg was just talking about about um, you know an eye towards nature that is that is different than the Western eye towards nature is something to be used and to consume. And this this particular poem is really pointing out the dangers of that. So it's called Vision Shadows. Wind visions are honest. Eagles clearly soar to the craggy peaks of the mind. The mind is full of sun prayer and child laughter. The mountains dream about pine brothers and friends. The mystic realm of boulders which shelter rabbit squirrels wrens. They believe in the power. They also believe in quick eagle death. The eagle loops into the wind power. He can see a million miles and more because of it. All, be all believe things of origin and solitude. But what has happened? I hear strange news from Wyoming of thallium sulfate, range ranchers bearing arms and helicopters to these visions. I hear foreign tremors, breath comes thin and treaded I hear scabs of strange deaths falling off. Snake hurries through the grass. Coyote is befuddled by his own tricks and bear whimpers pain into the wind. Poisonous fumes cross our sacred paths. The wind is still. Oh, blue sky, oh, mountain, oh, spirit, oh, what has stopped? Eagles tumble dumbly into shadows that swallow them with dull thuds. The sage can't breathe. Jackrabbit is lonely and alone with eagle gone. It is painful, I eat, without visions, to soothe dry whimpers or to repair the flight of eagle, our own brother. So that was from Thank you. From 1977, and um, he does a number of um, of poems that are similar to that, really talking about um, the impact on the environment. I also have a little story about Joy Harjo, if you want to hear it. Yeah, um, I um, taught at for ten years at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, and we. Um, I taught uh, all, like a compare all the comparative American ethnic lit classes, and I was in class one day in my Native American lit class talking, and one of my students raised her hand and she said, "My um, my grandma is a poet. Um, she's a Native poet." And I was like, "Oh, okay, but who is your grandma?" And she was like, "Joy Harjo." And I almost like buckled in class. I was like, what? And um, I, I was like, you mean, you mean Joy Harjo? She's like, yeah, Joy Harjo is my grandma. And I was like, oh my God. So, um, I, you know, I, I fangirled out a little bit and I talked to her later and then, and then, yeah, she lives in Oklahoma. So this was in the center of Wisconsin. So what was also true is that every year we had a um, common book for all the first year um, writing students that they everybody read it in all of their classes. And so we went we went with lots of different books. And it turned out that both um, uh, that Joy Harjo had just published her memoir, uh, Crazy Brave, in 2000. 12. So this was like 2013. And so I said, we should do this book because I think we have like, you know, we're just this little school school. I was like, I think we have an in, right? Like, I think we could probably, you know, say, convince her to come here because her granddaughter is here. So um, that began kind of an odyssey where I was like, you know, Denise probably can connect with this, like, 
talking to authors and working with agents and having really weird conversations for anybody who's in academia, like trying to manage that whole agent thing. Um, and in the end, we did, um, so it was something like um, 1200 students ended up reading that book together. And then, and, and we did things about it. And then she came and um, I talked to her on the phone and I, you know, I arranged for her to like get a car and she was really excited to see her granddaughter. And um, I, we had, we had a thing at my house. She was in my house. I fed her food. You know, I drove her around. We took her, she did all of these talks and, and then um, she was wonderful she was did a, did a couple of great conversations one with just students one that was like for the open for the public she was super gracious she was so excited to meet you know to be have you know we paid for her to come and visit her granddaughter and she got to talk and we sold all these books and so it was kind of like a win-win all around and um and then like a few months later I got this random email that was like Joy Harjo. And it was, she was like, I'm having trouble getting in touch with my granddaughter. Can you help me? And I ended up like connecting her, but I had never sort of thought that I would get like a person, dear Rachel, it's me, Joy. I can't get it. I was, I saved it. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. But that's my Joy, Joy Harjo. So then when she became the poet laureate, I was like, I felt my six degrees of separation very keenly and was super you know, just the reflective glow of, of knowing her, but she was really kind and uh, lovely. So that's my Jerry Harmon story. Oh, thanks for listening. I had no <laughs> idea we were going to have people today that were interacting with her in person recently. That's just very, very cool. Well, well, I have to say, I did laugh a little at your, you know, dealing with the agents. We, we have gotten so when we deal with our book of the year uh, prospective candidates and their agents, we call them the handlers rather than agents. It, it was just like a whole other language that like yeah. I suddenly had to learn where I was like, I, I. yeah, so yeah. she was very generous though. Yeah, well, but we, we had a granddaughter, so it was, yeah. it was pretty, you know. That's a nice connection, yeah, because that it gives was. a whole personal level, not just another, you know, gig, so. Yeah, it was exciting. Very cool. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think we've got Mark up next. This will work better if I unmute it. Rachel, we should talk about Mike Williams sometime. <laughs> I shared an office with him in graduate school for a number of years, so might have some interesting stories. Um, a short one um, and kind of an echo of the love poem that Paul read earlier. This is by Thomas King, who's a Greek and Cherokee um, heritage, um, spends most of his life in Canada, although he's taught at the University of Minnesota for a time, and he's much better known as a novelist. Uh, the Cuesta Library I know has at least one of his books, uh, which I highly recommend, called uh, Green Grass Running Water, a um, marvelous novel. Uh, this is a, a short piece from a book that he came up with two years ago uh, to celebrate his 77th birthday, and it's called 77 Fragments of a Familiar Ruin. Um, and like all poems, this one asks a certain amount from the readers and the listeners as well, so pay attention. This is fragment 19. Imagine I've written you a love poem. Imagine how it might sound in a warm wind, feel in a long caress, look waking up together in the morning. Imagine I've written you a love poem. See, that wasn't so hard. Yeah, that's yes. funny that, and I like that. Uh, there's another short one here, I might as well. Uh, this is fragment 38. Raven votes for herself and becomes prime minister. How could this happen? Ask the animals. It's easy, says Raven. When no one is paying attention, anything is possible. That has a very political feel to it. <laughs> it does. Um, All righty. Um, I think, um, Lori, this is what I'm thinking. I will read one, and then maybe we can jump back to you, and you can do your um, 
Hyde Erdrich, and then we can do the trippy video. What do you think? It's a plan. Okay. And I just heard from Tom Patchell, one of our English instructors. He might come, but he might not. So we'll just see. He may or may not show up. Um, and I did have one little question I thought we could answer in the chat. And this is certainly only if you feel like you want to respond to it. It's not meant to be intrusive. But I wondered if any of you um, present today uh, wanted to share if you or your family members or your partner or your cousins have Native American heritage. And if so, what tribe that is. And again, only if you feel like that's something you, you want to share in the chat. Okay, and I've got one by a uh, poet known as Nyla North Sun. She's Shoshone and Chippewa. Um, she uh, lives in uh, on a reservation in Fallon, Nevada. And this one is a little more in the, um, I don't want to say quite sarcastic, but a little more flippant, a little more hey, uh, kind of like Lori's with the uh, pizza and beer. Um, guy. And this is called I Gotta Be Indian Today. I came back to Nevada because somebody decided they needed a Native American on their radio show. And so I came to mind. I'm flattered and my ego drove me 200 miles over snow-packed mountains. But now, before the interview and reading, I'm panicked. I haven't written an Indian poem in a long time. Maybe only one out of a hundred poems even touch upon my tribalness. They think just because I am native means anything I write is somehow rooted in nativeness. But in flipping the pages of my three ring binder, I find nothing mentioning mother earth, feathers, reservations, even though I stand on Mother Earth, and my rear view mirror has an eagle feather tied, tied to it. And after the interview, I'll be heading right back to the reservation to see my family. Is that Indian enough for them? I don't know. I guess it will have to be tomorrow. I'll think deeper about being an Indian. And I'll just write her name in the chat. Nyla North Sun. Okay, so Lori, we'll bounce back to you then. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and share my screen before I read the poem, um, just to make sure I don't forget to do that optimized sound thing. Okay. So here we go. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. So um, this is a poem by Hyde Erdrich, and it's interesting that Don read a selection by her sister Louise earlier. Hyde is a lot less famous, um, and she's younger, but she's from the same family as Louise Erdrich, so uh, Ojibwa from Minnesota. Um, she's famous not only as a writer, but also as a publisher and producer, and um, what else did I want to add? Oh, she does these cool, like like Denise was saying, trippy poem films. And so after I read this poem by her, I will share with you one of her three minute poem films. So this one is called Stung. She couldn't help but sting my finger, clinging a moment before I flung her to the ground. Her gold is true, not the trick evening light plays on my roses. She curls into herself, stinger twitching, guilt wings folded. Her whole life just a few weeks, and my pain subsided in a moment. In the cold, she hardly had her wits to buzz. No warning from either of us. She sleeping in the richness of those petals, then the hand, my hand, cupping the bloom in devastating force, crushing the petals for the scent. And she mortally threatened, wholly unaware that I do this daily, alone with the gold last light, in what seems to me an act of love.
So let's take a look next at one of her other art forms. Um, like I just mentioned, she does short videos in collaboration with other artists that illustrate poems that she's written. So here's one called Heartline. And then it's also um, in Anishinaabe, which is the Ojibwe language. Ode Mekana, Heartline. Always following that one, always trailing. Ma Ingen Makan, the wolf's path in stars. Our first teacher, Ma Ingen, brother, the wolf. Always following that one, always trailing. Now you follow too. Our hearts align. What happens to one happens to the other. Ode Makan, Ma Ingen Makan, heart, path, wolf, trail, starway. Through Gagigigigig, forever sky, the animate universe. Now we animate. Ecliptic Maingan Makan, wolf trail, trailing moose, moose through Jibai ZD, river of souls, the Milky Way, the way we humans know all it is we know. No moose, sister who gave all to humans, Anishinaabeg. You follow too, you make a way, moose Maingan, moose wolf. Our hearts align. What happens to one happens to the other. Ode Makan, Maingan Makan, Heart Path, Wolf Trail, Starway, Through Gagige Gizik, Forever Sky, The Animate Universe. Now we animate. Overhead, that one follows. Summer to fall, Nibin to Guagan. Keep on the move to find moose. You follow too, you make a way. What happens to one happens to the other. Twin to my Ingham, Wolf Brother, our first teacher, your trail across our sky. We were pitiful, my Ingham. Then you showed us the way to lose, sister who gave everything. Food, clothes, sleds, shoes, tools, all we need to survive. Our hearts align, what happens to one happens to the other. Ode Makan, Ma Ingen Makan, heart path, wolf trail, star way, through Gagi Gagi, forever sky, the animate universe. Now we animate all that we learn from you, we give back now. Teacher, twin, brother, Ma Ingen, what happened to one happens to the other. What happens to one happens to the other. Our hearts align. What happens to us happens to our mother. The animate universe. The universe animates. Wow, that was very multi-sensual. Lori, how did you happen upon that? I was reading her bio yesterday, just wanting to have some tidbits to share with you guys. And it said she's a she's a video poet or some terminology that I had never heard of before. So I just Googled it and there there are maybe four or five um, okay. selections from one page. I'll, I'll put a link for anybody who wants to experience some other ones. Yeah, I, I think I want to rewatch that. There was so much going on in those three minutes. I definitely didn't pick up, you know, all of the pieces. The language was very interesting. Uh, but I didn't even focus on the animals and, and that, the, um, you know, the tracks. So, yeah, it got my heart. I don't know if anybody else felt it yeah. physically. Like, yeah, Ooh. I felt kind of wound up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, let's see where we are on time. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, and I want to be mindful of our time. Um, Don, did you have anything else you want to read? Or are you good? Yeah, I don't have um, anything. Okay, to, okay. Um, I've got another one. Um, Mark, anything else that you had stockpiled? You're muted. I can if, if you have time. Okay, let's just see who else. Is there anyone else that wanted to read that we haven't heard from? Somebody that's shy, kind of holding back? 
Okay, well, here's some choices. I've got one, Mark's got another, and then I have a, a, a about a five minute video of Joy Harjo, our poet laureate that we've been kind of talking about and hearing different people's um, interactions with, uh, of her reading one of her own poems. So we can take a look at that. Um, Mark, why don't you go and then I'll go and then we'll end with the video of Harjo. Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay, we have a plan. Okay, this is a, a short prose poem by an Ojibwe uh, poet named Jim Northrup, uh, who is not well known as a poet, better known probably, at least in the upper Midwest, as a kind of an essayist and columnist for various publications. Um, he died in 2016. And this work is called Gulf Oil. The start of the war was big news last month. It was on all the TV stations for three whole days. They didn't even break for commercials. After three days, the regular programming came back on. It started with the soap operas. I wondered about that. Then the titles of the soaps jump out at me. All my children have but one life to live. We know they need a guiding light in these days of our lives. But as the world turns, we don't want them to end up in a general hospital in Santa Barbara or anywhere else. We know they are the young and restless and bold and beautiful, but we pray they come home safe and soon. What year did you say that was written? Um, 1999, it was published in the Windsor Review, and I think it's a little earlier than that. Okay, so it was talking, is that the Gulf War, you think? Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a Marine, um, I think, in that war and right. others um, in his younger days. Okay. All righty. Um, the one I'm going to read is a poet I just discovered. I really don't know much about her, except that she was in this great, um, and I'd recommend, recommend this book. We have it in our library. I'll, I'll put it back in the shelf, uh, Living Nations, Living Words, and it's an anthology of um, First Peoples Poetry. It's pretty recent, and Joy Harjo was one of the editors. So this poet is named uh, Denise Sweet, and she is Anishinaabe, White Earth. Uh, in the Wisconsin area. She has a long academic and publishing career. Um, she's also a First Nations organizer. And this one is kind of in the vein of the more nature kinds of poems. It's called Palominos near Tuba City. And Tuba City is in Arizona and it's on the Navajo Nation. In the desert of burning dreams of armadillo and centipede, I would call this night pitch dark back home. I would watch for any star to pass into dream song or a point of light called planet to whirl and twist like a tiny pinwheel swallowing me to its vanishing point. Here under pewtery sky with words out of breath, I chase poems down like wild mares into fenced corrals I watch close calls with wisdom rear and kick against the fences of good judgment. I used to think the skies brought them home, thundering hooves and swollen bellies, ready to spark and fire the dry bony floor, sulfuric aroma real as rain. But now the horses of white lightning gallop toward me, afraid of nothing, they rush with an eye for hesitation, ready to brush up against my heart with their horse madness. Here, it is the rider standing in the wavering heat, erect and indisputable as a lightning rod, braced in the open. I stand my ground and wait, ready to hold on for dear life. I thought that was kind of very visual. I'm not sure what it all means, but it's visual. Okay, um, let me do one thing. Yeah, right, horses. <laughs> I'm going to do one screen share just to show you um, uh, the other events that we have coming up in the book of the year, and then we'll end with the, um, the video. So hang on for the screen share. Oops. 
Okay, so hopefully you're seeing the Cuesta Library events page. And um, Lori, maybe you could put that URL in the chat. So this is just telling you our other activities that are coming up. We have a free film screening that we are making available for the public. It's up now. So you could uh, view that um, up until April 15th. You do need to sign on with an Eventbrite uh, sign up to get the link. And then tomorrow afternoon, we have a discussion and kind of intro to that film with one of our um, campus uh, faculty, Zach McKiernan. That's also free, you just need to sign up. And then, um, well, that's gonna be too hard to read. That's our poster of all the events coming up with our book of the year. But let's just say, if you do wanna get tickets, this is the information. And it's also on that page that I showed you before. Hang on just a sec. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. As I bumble along here. Um, okay, so this is telling you on that same page, tickets, $5 general admission. And the interesting part that you want to know is that gives you access uh, either to in-person, if you're here in SLO in San Luis and you want to go into our theater, they do have a, a strict protocol. That's the place that Joan manages that we heard from first. And then um, if not, it also gives you simulcast. We're going to be taping simultaneously our author, Tom, Tommy Orange, and then you can watch that from home. So you've got a choice. If you're a student, you can attend free. You just need to let us know through this um, link, and that way we reserve a spot for you. All right. Oh, and actually, I was not screen sharing there, was I? Oh, well. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Okay, um, I think with that, we'll go over to the film. Let me get out of this. Oof. years of my growing up were the best because my parents were there and we had a kitchen table. My mother was a good cook and I remember making gingerbread men at the table. My father would bring, go hunting for uh, deer, bow hunting and bring in deer meat, which I, you know, I, and so everything kind of revolved and I noticed it still does. It revolves around the kitchen. That's where there's always this connection between food and story. And so right now we're kind of, all of us are sequestered <laughs> by, um, you know, I hope not by fear, but yeah, you know, for protection, you know, in our homes and around the kitchen table. So I'm gonna read this poem called Perhaps the World Ends Here. And I don't have a big, sometimes I have a big story about how a poem came to be written and often they surprise me. And this one I can remember sitting down and, and just moving. And that's what I like about poetry is that it's like you, you kind of hook into some place. It's, there can be an emotional stream. There can be an idea. There can be a phrase. There can be something you've been reading historically. And this one, I don't know, once I had that line, the world begins at a kitchen table. And in a way it does, it becomes the center. It can be the center place, the place where we eat food. I was thinking what human beings do you know, why are we here? What do we do? We go out and collect stories. <laughs> you know, that's what humans do. You know, insects do other things. You know, everybody's got their own thing they do. Well, we go out and collect stories. I think that would, that was a good first line. You know, not, you know, it, because it opens you up to um, all kinds of possibilities. This experience with the coronavirus is, we all kind of knew something was coming, you know, we're all going along, I think, in this country, in the world, knowing that we've transgressed and we've come to a particular place. And we've all been kind of on edge because of the climate change and, and economic instabilities. And, and we could all feel this. I just didn't know it was going to happen this way. I, you know, here we are. This is a changing point in society. And we've been at this. We've been 
with this precipice of change. And so the question we all have to ask is, um, are we happy with our home being divided? You know, are we happy with, you know, relatives, you know, not talking to us because we're not their religion? Or are we happy? No, this is not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be all sitting around the kitchen table. And we can have our differences. You know, I've loved classes that I've taught where people from all over the world and we're all sitting there and what joins us together is poetry huh. or a story, a good story or good food. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies tease at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make community. We make women. At this table we gossip. We call enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us. As they put their arms around our children, they laugh with us at our poor falling down selves. And as we put ourselves back together once again at the kitchen table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow, with pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table where we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Okay, and as you can see, I messed up. I had one video going and another one, uh, the audio going, but you, that was actually the poem she was reading is the one that we her, first heard from um, Joan when she started us off this afternoon, so. Alrighty, I want to thank everybody for showing up and I hope you do take advantage of having Tommy Orange uh, listening to him on April 21st, either in person or with the simulcast. Um, any last comments before we sign off and let you go on with your afternoon? Everybody's so polite and shy. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, the book is in the library. The book's in the library? Okay, Greg, thank you for sharing that with us. All righty, check out some of the Native American poetry books at your library. Thanks, everybody. Bye.